Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. So many more actors would be so much happier with the process of going to work, the process of auditioning, which is another part of work, if we recognize the power that we do have to advocate for ourselves. Welcome, listeners, to another episode of In the Envelope. Today's interview is with the one and only Simone Missick, a beautiful actor and human inside and out, who gave us a really wonderful material today uh, in terms of how to empower yourself as an actor and how to feel empowered on set in this career that, as Simone can attest to and speaks to wonderfully, is uh, not necessarily designed to empower actors. We hope that interviews like these on this podcast continue to guide you, if you are a working actor, towards your goals. And in keeping with that, speaking of which, backstage, this is my big, this is our big news today, this week, this month, listeners, backstage is turning 60 years old. Congratulations. Happy birthday. I don't know. I don't really know if we should call it a birthday or an anniversary. It is technically our diamond jubilee. I believe is what it's called. It's not a diamond birthday or diamond anniversary. It's a diamond jubilee. That is what we are having. That's what we're having here today on the podcast. For 60 years, Backstage has been, you know, the Actors Trade Publication, the number one resource for actors and casting professionals. It is so wild to me. It is so interesting and so always so, so wonderful to be a part of this legacy. And um, it's, a you know, it's something we get reminded of on this podcast when we speak to actors like Simone, who uh, have a history with Backstage and of course recognize our brand and have this special, lovely place in their hearts for the opportunities that Backstage afforded them or the sense of community, even just picking up an old print newspaper or magazine of Backstage. That is often what allows especially early career actors to really feel a part of this artistic community and I'm just so excited. I'm so happy to be part of this team that is really growing this brand and taking it to the next level. And yeah, since that is happening this month, I believe it was exactly six years ago in in December that Backstage first became a thing. Anyway, happy birthday Backstage. Yay. And uh, stay tuned, listeners, for this wonderful interview with Simone. What a perfect way to cap off this momentous occasion. Um, And afterwards, stay tuned for Christine McKenna-Torella's segment, which is wonderful this week. Reminder, she is pointing you listeners, you working actor listeners, towards the resources, the articles, the materials you need to read on backstage that kind of supplement these interviews, follow up these podcast deep dive discussions. So do check our episode description. And if you're on backstage.com, do check out the full articles that are written up for each of these episodes, where we list the casting notices that Christine recommends each week, as well as a couple of pieces of editorial content. And just to remind everyone, listed in every episode description is links to Backstage and in the envelope social media. But also, if you're brand new, a link to subscribe to Backstage to get an account, uh, to browse our casting listings, to check out our newest community-driven virtual programming, The Slate. And as always, we are including a link to our message of solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. Do check that out in this episode description and every episode description in weekly podcast episodes going forward. Thank you, as always, for listening. Happy holidays, and we will see you next week for what will happen to be our New Year's Eve episode. But for now, let's take a quick break and then hear from the lovely Simone Missick. 
Yay! Hey, if you are an actor or an aspiring actor, someone at the beginning of your artistic career, and you haven't signed up for Backstage yet and you don't know how it works, I have good news for you. Backstage is offering 30 whole days completely free just for our In The Envelope listeners. If you visit backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope, you will have full access to the site where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start applying to the thousands of casting notices uploaded every single day on the world's number one casting platform. Again, we are giving listeners of this podcast 30 days completely free to try out Backstage. Go to checkout, that's backstage.com slash subscribe, and enter the code ENVELOPE. If you want to be in contention for an Emmy or for an Oscar or for a Tony or for a SAG award, do as many of the guests on this podcast have suggested and use Backstage. We are here for you. Again, free 30-day trial, backstage.com slash subscribe. Enter the code ENVELOPE. Simone Missick brings her most authentic self to her stage and screen roles and empowers other actors to do the same. A Howard University graduate originally from Detroit, Simone did guest TV roles and bit parts in movies for years before breaking out as Misty Knight on Marvel's Luke Cage. She recently starred on season two of Netflix's Altered Carbon and plays the lead role of LA County Superior Court Judge Lola Carmichael on All Rise, CBS's hit legal drama. Here's our interview with Simone Missick. Hi, Simone. Hi, Jack. How's it going? It's going great. How are you? I'm doing okay. It's um, what a crazy year. I feel like to be talking to you, 2020 is a crazy year in general, but I feel like especially for you. Yeah, 2020 has been insane, you know. The pandemic, the (laughs) shutdown, the shooting of a virtual episode, Uh you know, going back to shooting, which has been just, you know, a blessing. Um, But at the Uh same time, you're constantly concerned about your own safety, the safety of your coworkers and your family and your friends. I found myself yesterday, there were two background actors. Mm-hmm. They were standing close to each other with no masks. Like, uh-huh. <laughs> what is happening? Please. That's actually really Stop cool. To, it's interesting to hear that. I mean, that's, I have so many questions for you. Um, <laughs> because, so we've been, we've, this podcast airs weekly and we've done so many interviews and we did especially a, a batch of interviews in like April and May when the pandemic was new and lockdown was new. So I was talking to a lot of people about like, how are you doing in the pandemic? And also like, aren't you glad that you have a project to talk about, but not be um, in production? Right. You're the first person we've talked to who not only are, did you, did you have a show that produced a virtual episode, but you are then also currently in production and it's just started airing again, which yeah. puts you in like a totally unique class and it's actually interesting to hear that that it's a stressful that it can be a stressful experience on set it can you know um and our show thank god uh we're not set in a it's not a historical piece we're not set in the future you know we're not set in the 60s so because it's current we have the ability to deal with the pandemic which then means the added extra layer of safety for the actors. So, Mm. you know, in a lot of scenes, we are wearing masks. We are wearing shields. Uh, We do have plexiglass up because Mm -hmm. they are trying to replicate not only what is it like in the real world, but also what is it like in the real court system? Right. Uh, So that is one layer, but then the other part of it is that because we are focused and and walking with that purpose of being truthful and honest to what is mm. really happening mm. we also practice that on set so right. like most sets you know i'm sure that you probably heard or at least read the you know, Mm -hmm. the big memorandum on how we could get back to work safely, there are zones and there are pods and, you know, all of these things are separated. And so it makes shooting so different Mm 
Yeah. Because uh, normally, you know, you see your DP, you see your camera crew, your grips and your gaffers and your lighting people and your sound guys come up and they make sure you're wired and you're, mm -hmm. you know, your set dressers are making sure everything is buttoned. And this is a very uh, autonomous uh -huh. kind of a way to shoot. So huh. in the, the final episode of last season that we produced virtually, yeah. we did everything ourselves as the actors, everything. you're doing your own hair, your makeup, your, all of that here, <laughs> our camera crew comes in, they set up, they leave. Oh, weird. Hmm. So you as the actor comes in and the only people in the room are you and the other actors. You don't have to worry about, because oh we're, we're shooting with these black box cameras. So they literally place them oh. all over the, the room, sometimes 16 cameras at a time. Oh my Your gosh. coverage is their coverage. Okay. So there is no, let me phone it in. Let me warm up, oh. <laughs> no. which I love. <laughs> I personally love it as an actor because I mean, you know, I how see. often does that happen where somebody's like, yeah, camera's not on me. So sorry. And I'm like, no, your coverage no is way. my coverage at all times. So to actually have to have that be the reality for everyone is great. Um, but you know, it's funny, your reaction was, Oh wow. You know, to not have the <laughs> camera crew in there, but how many times have you looked across and somebody's on their phone and you're like oh, in the middle of a scene. So now you don't have to worry about, uh -huh. yeah, you don't have to worry about those distractions. It's just you and the other actor. And it feels even more dropped in and connected in a way sure. that, um, you know, is kind of a gift of the way yeah. that we're now shooting. Um, but it, you know, there, there is a little bit of anxiety, you know, I yeah. spend a lot of time in my trailer, mm -hmm. um, just because when, when they yell cut, it's like, I'm going back just to, yeah. you know, clear the air and breathe without a mask minimize on and yeah. minimize the risk. Crazy. Um, at the end of the day, every person is making sacrifices, um, yeah. in, in the world, you know, to, mm -hmm. to keep themselves safe, to keep their family members safe and to, and to go to work. And so mm. this just feels like that, you know, these yeah. are the, these are the sacrifices that we have to make. You can't hug people. You can't high five them. You can't stand around and talk <laughs> to them for longer than, you know, 15 minutes cumulative for over 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> unmasked. Um, except for the actors. So we're our own little, you know, safety pod, but it, the, the shooting without the camera crew in front of you is actually kind of a gift. Sure. It shooting. sounds like theater. And, oh. and, you know, that's my first love. Yeah. So it most certainly, uh, it feels wonderful to be able to, to have that on set. Yeah. Um, and to have, you know, I've got great theater trained Tony award-winning actresses. You certainly do. And actors on our show. And so it's <laughs> wonderful that we all get to play around in that medium and yet doing mm -hmm. it for TV. So it's kind of great. It's kind of great. Oh, okay. Without the pandemic aspect. <laughs> yeah. It's stressful to step out of the house. So that's just going to be a part of any job any job description yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, stress. you know, it's stressful going to the, to the doctor's office and the chiropractor and, you know, yeah. I don't, I try to avoid the grocery store as much as possible, but yeah. every now and again, you got to go. And those, I find myself <laughs> having a yeah. bit of anxiety and, and yet going to work feels like the safest of places mm. at times. Yeah with all of the testing and all of the screening and Great. everyone kind of being on the same accord at work. Now you can't, mm -hmm. you don't know what people are doing at home. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for the most part, everyone has to come in with a certain mindset. And so there is a level of, of safety in that maybe it's false, but I, it <laughs> gets me, it gets me out of bed in the morning. Yeah. Like this really is a test of and a testament to actors and crew having a lot of trust and like the the ideal of a set having a bunch of collaborators who are true collaborators i mean in this case looking up for each other's safety to the nth degree to a degree no one's ever had to do before yeah um 
you know, I, I always thought that the highest level of trust I was going to have to have on a set was like stunts. <laughs> stunts. <laughs> well, you're like, used to stunts. You yeah. know, just, just propel yourself off the side of the, this thing. Like, Is it safe? Yeah. You're like, yeah, it's totally safe. <laughs> <laughs> and then you break something like that. I thought that was the highest level, but yeah, it, it is a, a huge, a tremendous amount of trust. Um, yeah. And it just, you know, our, our set has always been like a family. We always, always, always just cared for one another. Um, and so it, shows. I, it, I can it just tell. feels like an extension. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. We've got, we've got an amazing, amazing crew. Like mm-hmm. I, and that's what kind of makes yeah. it hard is it's like only outside yeah, and from 15 feet away can you and see you're waving. Somebody yeah. And you're like, how's it going? Yeah. I'm family. I'm <laughs> grandma. <laughs> <It's so Yeah. laughs> well, so this is maybe, maybe so random, but also I kind of feel like it's these days it's relevant. Can you explain mask acting and give advice <laughs> on how, <laughs> because that actually is like our working actor listeners may need to know how to best maximize your face when half of it is covered. Yeah. You know, uh, I have been told that I'm expressive with my eyes. Hmm. Uh, so I think that that certainly helps. Mm-hmm. Um, and on, in our, our next episode, there's a young man who's the defendant. Uh, he plays a character named Jesse Frost and he is sitting across from me on set and I felt every single thing that he had to offer. Mm. And he's wearing an N95. Mm. He didn't say to himself, well, half my face is covered. Okay. He, he didn't dial back his performance mm. because he was wearing a mask and gotcha. he was conscious of it. He was completely dropped in. And I think that that um, shows and it only continues the the idea of when the camera is on, you are always on. You, there mm. is no opportunity. There is no need for you to dial it back. Um, mm. Or, uh, uh, you know, so often actors, especially when we're just starting out, are told, you know, it's smaller for the camera. Sure. Just dial it in. Just dial Especially it back. theater actors. Yeah. Especially theater actors. We're always yeah. told that, you know, just bring it back. And yeah. I think that that's, <clears throat> that's such a disservice to mm. the actors. Uh, I, I have never seen a performance on camera of Viola Davis where I thought, oof. You got to tone it She back. had just pulled it back. <laughs> And okay. I think that it is because of that, co- that theater training, those yeah. years of like, that kind of work that she has now infused into television and into film yeah, that has allowed for the other actors who come from that school to recognize that it's not about dialing it back or making it small. Or mm. of course, yes, there are intimate moments mm. at, where, you know, you don't have to pretend as though you're playing for 350 people and there are folks in the mezzanine, but the adjustment isn't dialing it back, quote unquote. Yeah. Intimacy Just does not have to mean small. Small, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I think that, you know, mask acting can be even freer for actors uh, more than anything because it allows for you to let everything that you would normally bring be uh, present uh, because it's needed, it's necessary mm-hmm. because part of your face is covered. Um, so that, that would be my, you know, that's great. My, my advice and, and maintain safety when donning and doffing your mask. <laughs> we, <laughs> doffing. I, we just, uh, <laughs> that's the technical term. My brother works for the nurses union. So he's like doffing yes. your mask. Uh-huh. Uh, a, a fellow classmate uh, from Howard university, Isaiah Johnson, phenomenal actor, yes. Broadway actor. He's also on um, David makes man. He's tremendous. He's in these next, two episodes that at one point Isaiah was getting hot. He was like, shit, shit. and he oh. takes off his mask. And he starts patting his face. And I was like, Isaiah, that's- no, <laughs> that's the opposite of mask safety. Yeah. If there's something on your mask, you just put it on your face. He's like, Oh yeah. 
You're right. So that's, <laughs> that's, your that's, the, that's the other advice I would give. Yeah. You. yeah. yeah. Don't use your mask as your, uh, your blotting <laughs> paper. Yeah. Well, and you can tell even in this first episode, your, your mask, what is it? Doffing <laughs> second nature. Like you've already got it down to like, I think that's maybe an important step too, is that the sa- the actual safety protocols, like not touching your face has mm-hmm. to be ingrained like yeah, as ingrained yeah. as your lines. Maybe it does. <laughs> Yeah. I would also say, you know, one of the things that is, is always hard for actors on set, and it doesn't matter at what stage you're in, is advocating for yourself. Yes. And I've seen a lot of people over the years just do things that were unsafe because someone asked mm. them to. Huh. And it, it, it might not be until later that they say, you know, I was kind of uncomfortable with that. Or if they get injured, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that take a second time or, mm. you know, any of those things. Um, and that especially has to go with mask wearing and social distancing. Mm. You know, um, you because we are all tested, there is a level of safety mm-hmm. that we rely on. But as we all know, that's not 100 percent. And so. I find myself picking up on background actors and guest actors who are coming to, you know, play Mm -hmm. for the day, picking up on their anxiety when someone says, can you, okay, can you take your mask off in this moment? And it's like, are you okay with that? You, are you seriously okay with that? And if Mm -hmm. the answer is no, well, what can be the alternative? Can they put on Mm -hmm. a face shield? Can they put on the mask and then take it off and put it on in the scene? Do they have to be closer than six feet? We, I think it just extends how much we are all looking out for each other because, you know, there, there does become that part of it where you know that you don't want to make it the mask show where everybody's just watching everyone in masks. But in order for us to keep making this television that you want to watch every week, (laughs) we have to be safe. So that's the other part of it is if you're on set and you feel unsafe, and someone yeah. is asking you to do something, you have to advocate for yourself. You have to. And yeah. I don't think, especially during this time, anyone would fault that. They would go, oh, Gosh. this guest actor is on here. And they, you know, they want us to make sure that they're six feet away. Yeah. And they want to have on a mask. You yeah. know, it's it's understandable. Yeah. That's really spot on advice. I think especially for um on this podcast, we've heard as you say, there are so many examples of the actor. The actor is often the artist with the least amount of power or, or, or feels the least empowered Mm -hmm. to say something, but you're saying it doesn't matter whether you're on set for the first day of your life or your very early career, you got to advocate for yourself and definitely advocate for others. If you can, Mm -hmm. that's great advice. You know, every set isn't the same, Mm -hmm. obviously. And there are some sets I'm sure I've heard, uh, thankfully I've not been on, but where, you know, people don't respect Mm -hmm. actors that are, you know, just visiting for the day or they're, you know, younger, newer or whatever. That's what you have your reps there for. That's what you have your SAG reps for. That's what Mm -hmm. you have your, now you've got COVID team reps, uh, to, to say like, Hey, this, I don't, can we, can we discuss this? Um, but I think that similar to the way that actors walk into rooms for auditions. Mm -hmm. We have to walk in knowing that we have the most power. Okay. As opposed to looking at it like, Oh, I'm the person with the least power in the room. I'm just trying to get the job. Mm. It's like, they would be lucky if they got me for this particular project. (laughs) And, and sometimes you got to tell yourself that for years, I certainly did. Absolutely. I certainly had to tell myself that for years of no's of no thanks, you know, but you, how could you continue to do something for, you know, 10 years and continue to believe in yourself if you didn't Mm. have a certain level of empowerment and self, you know, belief. Uh, So, yeah, I think so many more actors would be so much happier with Mm the process of going Mm -hmm. to work, the process of auditioning, which is another part of work. Um, 
Mm. If we recognize the power that we do have to advocate for ourselves to, mm. you know, we always say when you're going into an audition, take control of the audition. If you want to put the chair over there, you put the chair over there, mm-hmm. you go in, you say, Hey, I'm going to stand here. And then I'm going to sit there. And, you know, that's always the mark of like a confident actor, right? Someone who walks in. Well, the same thing can be said when you're on set. Okay. You know, continue that, uh, continue that empowerment of yourself. It's, it's refreshing to, to see, and to hear actors who are not afraid to share a perspective or an opinion in mm. the moment. Mm. Um, and no, everybody doesn't need to know what, <laughs> what your character's backstory is. Oh. The guy working in the coffee shop, you know, that's your own personal secret, but we do want to know why you're choosing this. Uh, uh-huh. I, I think it adds to the, the collaborative nature of, you know, the work that we do. Yeah. Um, and for some reason, people think when you step onto a film set or a TV show set, that that collaborative nature becomes a hierarchy. Okay. Right. Versus when you do theater, someone mm-hmm. could have three lines. Someone could have, five, you know, five scenes where they don't have any lines. You don't say to that person, you know, we don't really care why you think you should go over there and pick this up at this mm-hmm. moment because we've got all the, the work over here. That's not how you create that art. And no. to me, it doesn't change based on the medium. Gotcha. Um, I remember doing an episode of Ray Donovan mm-hmm. and I was working opposite Leah Schreiber in this scene. And it was a small part. It was a co-star. Um, mm-hmm. It was two scenes. It was maybe seven lines you know it Mm. wasn't a big you know big deal and um I came in you know ready to work and we did the first rehearsal and there was this and then maybe it's all in my it was all in my head but there was this moment of like recognition where he's like oh you are an actor (laughs) okay and the process completely opened up he was like well Simone what do you think you would do in this moment and oh, Simone nice. do you think you would stand over here okay and he's talking to the director mm. and he's like you know I think Simone would Simone well you know tell him what you think like what and it was so oh. empowering this is yeah. a man who you know this is the second season at the time of the show but incomparable actor you know so Mm. accomplished one of the greatest shakespearean actors that we have Mm -hmm. you know to date he's been credited with and did not look at me little black girl with (laughs) four lives yeah one day you know and go okay yeah right and it was it it was an education um Mm. on how to be the lead of the show Hundred mm-hmm. percent on how to make oh, people so cool. feel empowered and, and right. collaborate, um, and be generous to your fellow actors, regardless of their quote unquote station, uh, right within within the episode or the season or the scene. Totally. And so, yeah, I think that if we all extended that not only to performances but also to set, set safety. Yes. Um, yeah. We would be in a, in a better, continue to be in a better place. Sort of like, ha- like harnessing the hierarchy that is kind of inherent in any Hollywood situation and turning it into more of an ensemble, collaborative, maybe more yeah. theatery environment. I, I think so. I mean, yeah. we know that those, that those hierarchies exist because mm-hmm. that's how people continue to control the money and, and make the decisions. Indeed. So we, you know, that in a way, we, we know that in most situations, that's, that's how it is going to be. But it doesn't mm. have to be that way, I don't think. Right. It doesn't have to be that way. And that's where the empowerment, that's where the empowerment comes in, for sure. Yeah. Um, t- take me back to the beginning. You mentioned lots of no's. Um, <laughs> I don't want to, <laughs> it's like on this I podcast. I love talking about the nose. <laughs> you do. Well, that's actually good. Cause I was getting, this podcast is like, I don't want to make people dwell on their horrible audition stories or whatever, but we are backstage. <laughs> those, are, those are great. And those are informative. Of course. Like what, first of all, did you ever use backstage? Are you familiar with us? 100%. 100%. Hey. 
<laughs> um, I, I wish I had written down what jobs I booked from backstage. <gasps> Okay. There weren't a lot, but there were okay. some. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah. I mean, I remember being a college student and, you know, traveling to New York on the weekends, you know, just to hang out because I went to school in D.C. at Howard. And yeah. Pick up the actual paper copy of Backstage. Okay. And then when I moved back home before I moved to L.A., mm. uh, it was like, gosh, by the time it gets here. The jobs oh. are already gone. <laughs> oh, the mail. How interesting. The, the mailer, you know, yeah. but it was still uh, so a part of, <laughs> it, it was all that there was when it came to mm. finding out about auditions. And um, this was way before, you know, Actors Access and uh, LA Casting and all of those. Mm. It was like backstage was the place to look, but then it was also the place to read about, you know, mm-hmm. actors' journeys and, always a dream of mine um to, to grace to grace the pages <laughs> of that yeah. stage. um and so yeah i i definitely definitely okay. read and used backstage that's great yeah. and was it always so childhood dream was this why i, I want to ask the big question of why acting was it always mm-hmm. acting was the dream no i mean when i was like eight I wanted to be a veterinarian (laughs) and then um probably that very next year I was like no acting Mm -hmm. and (laughs) it it, or at the same time like I think I thought I could be an actor slash veterinarian (laughs) sure um and it it was always the dream um since I was you know in in elementary school um I tell this story at my sister's eight years older than me and Mm -hmm. she was in drama class and she would come home and rehearse for the plays that they were doing. Okay. And she uh, was rehearsing Rose from Fences. Oh. And speaking of Viola Davis. (laughs) Speaking of six degrees of Viola Davis. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And so she, uh, I remember her doing that monologue and I was like, oh, no, that's what I want to do in life. That's cool. That's what I want to do. Uh, and I was always a very performative child. Uh-huh. I was always watching TV and doing voices and imitating characters and, you know, reenacting commercials and just performing mm-hmm. for my family. I'm the baby of the family. So it was like, how else do you make a way in this one? <laughs> so mm-hmm. I was always, um, you know, acting. And yet I did not pursue acting until high school. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, I played the violin, I played basketball, I ran track, I, you know, did all of those traditional things. And I remember looking at my drama club at high school and I was like I'm not doing that crap those uh, people <laughs> I'm not doing that with those people uh and so I ended up doing a children's theater troupe okay um mm. interestingly enough with Maggie Keenan Bolger and her brother oh, yeah. um now I can't remember his name but we were we were in Andrew. this little Andrew thank you <laughs> we were in this uh in oh this because school. Michigan yeah. Yeah. Michigan. We were in this little theater troupe mm. Did this silly play where she played a cat. I played a dog. I forget what Andrew played, but <laughs> it was quite silly. <laughs> uh, I was not a singer, oh. not, not like them. And it, it was a musical theater piece. Um, and that was the extent of it other than literally turning every school project into a play. It was always like, Mm. okay, can we talk about the uh, French Revolutionary War? And I was like, yeah, in drama. (laughs) And I would try to take everything and act it out. So by the time I uh, graduated, I was too terrified to major in theater. Okay. Okay. And I Mm. thought, this is my dream. And if somebody tells me, no, God, that's the end of that dream. So I didn't, I majored in English and I told my parents mm. I wanted to be uh, Cokie Roberts, the black version, because okay. my AP English teacher was like, you know what, Simone, you just speak so well. You're so smart. 
you should be, you could be Cokie Roberts. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And so I, uh, I went to Howard, I majored in English and, um, I ended up taking an acting for non-majors class okay. and that was it. I had a phenomenal teacher, Professor Kim Bay. Um, she's just, just, she was, she was the thing. She was the turning point for me. Um, it made me feel like I knew I had something mm. to offer. Um, mm. And, you know, there were other teachers there like Vera Katz who also, you know, empowered me into thinking that I wasn't, I wasn't kidding myself. Um, but right. Professor Bay was the person that I, after taking her class, I was like, should I change my major? She's like, no, just keep mm. taking as many classes as you want. Mm. Just take as many classes as you can. And that was what I did. I ended up uh, graduating with a minor in theater. Mm. Everyone thought I was a theater major. They're like, wait, you're not walking across the stage with us. And I was like, no, technically I'm, I'm an English major. They're like, what the hell? Uh, and, so and that was it. That was it. I went to, um, I graduated with a theater minor. I ended up studying at Bada that summer. Okay. Graduation. Yeah. So, I have to tell you, I've also gone to Bada. You and I are ah! both. Um, <laughs> I guess I don't, there's nothing really to ask, except, of course, it informed your education as yeah. it did mine. Yeah. I also was mostly the English major, and then I like mm -hmm. snuck in the drama degrees and, <gasps> and somehow ended up with both. Like, actually, similar, similar trajectory wow. there. Wow. Yeah. Wasn't Bada amazing in terms of like totally studying abroad? Studying abroad in another and country. Seeing yeah, seeing a ton of theater that mm -hmm. was in a culture that really took theater seriously. Yeah. I mean, that must have really opened your eyes to like, the Brits, they take their theater, that is a way of life. That is, if you do theater in England, then you are, then that is your career. Yeah. And not it's, not here, it's but, but the, the idea of, um, it's a career like someone who goes to the bank. It's exactly. a career like someone who works yeah. as a teacher. It's a yeah. career, a, a respected career. It's right. not a career where people are like, oh, because you want to be famous. Sure. It's, mm. No, this is my job. This yeah. is what I've chose, chosen to do. That was definitely uh, refreshing because I never, I wanted to always be successful, but I was never necessarily interested in being famous. Which I think you know? is the right philosophy. I think that's the the one that helps you maintain your sanity. <laughs> the Brits, it was like, right. no, this is this is your job. Um, yeah. That was amazing to see. It was also interesting to hear. I remember Alan Reichman did a master class, and he was talking about how nobody cares what is you know how you get there basically i'm just I'm paraphrasing terribly. oh sure nobody cares how you get there emotionally mm. on the day mm. nobody cares that you're beating your dead cat in your head or <laughs> that you're crying about your dead grandma nobody cares your job is to get there okay every single time mm. uh and that was so freeing for me as a young actor because okay. I felt like so many of the techniques that I've been taught in school and that I had been exposed to at the time really required a life experience that I didn't have yet you know okay right I graduated college at 20 just barely 21 mm -hmm. um and I had a pretty amazing upbringing a healthy family unit my parents are still married 40 you know three odd years later or something like that um i didn't have a lot of the things to draw from. my grandparents were all alive like you know <laughs> there had been no no real trauma that i had yet experienced mm. um i had just you know experienced heartbreak for the first times and and you know love loss but when you look at the materials that are available to young actors and exactly. the things that you're asked to do, I was like, you know, using these techniques with this 
source material, I'm not finding a way into it. Okay. And so it was interesting to hear, you know, him speak a lot about like, nobody cares about what you're playing in your head to mm-hmm. get there. You just have to get there. And that, yeah. that eventually along with other teachers and, and techniques and, and study and life, life. growing mm-hmm. life, you know, to me has been the greatest education. Um, that helped me to become the actor that I, that I am sure. continuing to grow to be, but it took a long time. Uh, yes. it, it took a while and those no's, thank God they happened. You know, I was well, in exactly. LA for 10 years. Right. The no's are the life experience in a way, like oh, oh, they inform yeah. totally. Oh, <laughs> they are yeah. the trauma. <laughs> I had a, I had a wonderful no such an integral no. It was uh-huh. the best no I have ever had. <laughs> I was in New York. My husband and I were visiting. Uh, we were just in Brooklyn. And I got an audition for mm-hmm. 12 Years a Slave. Oh, the film. I was, oh. Like, yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So self-taped in the brownstone that we were, you know, staying in, had a very grounded, wonderful audition. And this was during a time where, you know, I would get an audition and get a call back once every, like never, like it was rare. (laughs) Gotcha. You know what I mean? To get a call back and for it to be a film of this caliber, like there was this energy in LA about Mm. how important this project was. Mm -hmm. And so, I got a call back and I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And my husband was like, I mean, you gave a really phenomenal audition. Mm. I was like, great. And I come back to LA and I decide to go see my old acting coach mm-hmm. and have her coach me through the performance. Wonderful woman, wonderful teacher, not the best thing to do oh, because they've God. already seen what you've had to give you're Mm. already you've already shown them what you have and that choice of going to see her was self-doubt okay i see it was me not trusting my own performance Mm. and And me going to her overthinking Mm. Mm. and i went in and she changed the entire thing i see and I love her to death, but you know, she's a middle-aged Canadian white woman. Okay. And she's like, <laughs> your, slave. your slave is not authentic. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> or whatever it was that she, you know, yeah. saw and, and tried to shape and change. And I just remember going into the audition and doing it the, for the first time in front of the casting director. And there was this look of complete bewilderment, like, what the did you do? Excuse me. But like, what did you do? Like why? (laughs) It's not the the performance that you, Mm. yeah. Uh, Mm. And my husband always would say to me, live and die on your own choices. Okay. (laughs) And that was single handedly the moment where I said, Oh, Oh yeah. You got (laughs) to live and die on your own choices. If I had gone Mm. in there, done the performance that I, you know, previously found on my first audition Mm. and not gotten the role, which I probably wouldn't have because I I truly believe that who is meant to to be in a particular Mm. role, that role is for them. And it Mm. has so many things to do with spirit and God and everything else. So that wasn't my role to get. Uh And yet I would have felt completely at peace with the audition because I was going to live and die on my own choices. And so when I walked out of that room, I was like, you idiot. I can't believe that you did that. I mean, that's like actor 101, like do Mm. not change the performance. Uh, Go with your gut. And that go with your gut and that doubt, Mm. that self doubt Mm. got in the way, but Mm. it was such a tremendous learning experience. I never did anything like that ever again. Um, right. And I, I truly feel at peace every mm. time, you know, I put myself on tape for something or I audition okay. for something because I feel like 
whatever I do to get there. And, and it doesn't mean I, I wouldn't go to a coach. It's like, but whatever you, yeah. you do to get there yeah. is what you do to get there and, yeah. and be comfortable with that. Uh, mm-hmm. Unless they say, yeah, come back, but be completely different and better. Then that's, that's, <laughs> that's something, that's something else. There. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's following um, your instincts and yeah, feeling empowered and knowing yourself enough to know the first instinct might be the best instinct. Yeah. Especially like you said, you felt so grounded in that first yeah. tape. So there's your, um, there's your sign that that's, yeah, the, that's, that's a great star. audition philosophy. Yeah. That you want to, you want to be able to leave that audition room saying, it doesn't matter if I don't book this. I gave mm-hmm. it 100% my all. I made the exact right choices that I thought were the right choices. And that comes from feeling empowered, walking into the room. Totally. Not, not caring that, please, God, can, can I get the job? Can I get the job? Give me the job. Give me the job. Can you see that right. I really want the job? The I would really love the job, the desperation. Yeah. And, and that, again, that's life. That's growing. Mm-hmm. That's living of, of getting a lot of no's where you can yeah. get over that to an extent. And, and I think that like life, our career path is so it's so many ups and downs and waves and plateaus and mountains and peaks and valleys that there might be, there might be times where you experience that over and over again, you know, that cyclical nature of like, Oh, I'm comfortable where I am. I don't get the job. It's not there for me. Oh my God, please give me a job. Please give me a job. Okay. (laughs) No, I'm comfortable where I am. If I don't get the job, Oh my God, I need a job. I need a job. You know, that, that cycle could happen. Um, Yeah. And, and there's, there's nothing, uh, unnatural okay. about those feelings coming back up, I, but that's you do have to, you do have to quiet that voice in yourself. Totally. Know that that voice will be there. It's just a part of the, the gig, those ups yeah. and downs. Yeah. It's on. totally a part of the gig. It's not like we chose to be a lawyer where you, you know, sure. you, you work at a firm, maybe you make partner. And then you get cases and you win some and you lose some Yeah, and you make more money. Like we didn't pick a career with a lot of stability, (laughs) any stability. Right. Uh, We, we picked something, you know, that, that has the ups and downs. And I think so much of it is, is learning to quiet that, that Mm. self doubt. Will I ever work again? Will I get, a job? Will I have a breakthrough? Will, you know, these Mm. things happen. I trust and and believe God that, you know, I'm where I'm supposed to be and I Mm. will continue to be able to work and do work that makes me happy. Mm. Um, that's the, that's the thing that my husband and I talk about a lot, you know, and my thought is just be happy. If you're doing something because you think it's the right career move, he's a strategist. You know, mm-hmm. he's always like, oh, but if I do this, then it can lead to that. And he's been that way his whole life. He was a child actor, started, mm-hmm. you know, he booked a Coca-Cola commercial when he was like 10 or something like that. Mm-hmm. He's been working ever since. And he's always been a strategist. Uh-huh. And in this I business. Have, right. In this business. And, and, you know, if you talk to him, he's very honest about feeling like that strategy has not served him. Uh-huh. Or, or the things that he thought were going to be, oh, here it is. You know, he was unfortunately right. surprised that it was not that way. And I've talked to other actor friends like that who right. have gotten wonderful opportunities that they thought were going to be the things that just skyrocketed their career. And then they didn't. Right. Uh, and it took a little bit more work and more time. And so I have always, or I have learned to be a person that just, tries to trust God that, you know, if something is meant for me, it's meant for me. Totally. And if, if something isn't going to make me happy, then it's probably not meant for me. You know, when it comes to choosing work, you know, some people choose jobs, uh, for a, a myriad of reasons. And then you'll hear, you know, like, Oh man, that was the best thing I ever did. And I, everyone told me not to do it and I did it. And I'm Mm. so happy that I did. And then you hear the opposite. Everybody told me I should do it and I did it and I hated it. And it's always interesting to hear, uh, those both sides of that, you know, in order to decide why do you choose to do the things that you choose to do as an actor? 
Totally. And it sounds like the, the guiding light for you is just kind of chase the, or follow your, follow your bliss, I guess, of like, is this going to make me happy? I think that's a great barometer of how to decide what to pursue. Yeah. And when I, when I say happy, it's not just like, Oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to frolic through a field. It's like, is this going to challenge me as an actor? Mm -hmm. Is it going to make me grow? Is it going to, is it terrifying? Does it bring something out of me that I've never explored before? I think, you know, with theater, especially, Mm. I think that whenever I get a job, it, it feels spiritual. I feel like I am meant to take on this role Mm. in order to discover something new about myself or to discover a different color of who I am. I've gotten to play some really great, uh, characters on stage and some really wonderful pieces. Um, and I think about, you know, I played, uh, Shun in the red and brown water the brother's sister plays by Terrell McCraney mm. um and then I played Kame in Mountaintop by Katori Hall and then mm. most recently uh I got to play Silver in Dominique Morisot's Paradise Blue and which I saw oh <laughs> yes oh did it was you wonderful. yeah thank you it was you were so mysterious and ah. talk about a spiritual experience. That must have been a spiritual experience. I mean, it was, it really was. We just um, got a chance to record it for Audible at the World oh, cool. Town Theater Festival. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and it was huh. tremendous to be able to step back into those shoes. It was so spiritual for me because I'm from Detroit, it was set mm-hmm. in Detroit. Um, the women in my, in my mother's family migrated from North Carolina Mm -hmm. to Detroit, uh, roughly around that time. And talk about bringing your life experience. That's a perfect example of a role where you don't have to worry about like, do I have enough life experience or do I have enough perspective on this project? I think you're so spot on for saying at age 21, most people can't match the extremes that, great drama really requires. Yeah. So for something like that, it, uh, you can draw from your personal experience. I mean, it goes back to what you're saying about what Alan Rickman said about, um, it doesn't matter how you get there, right? It doesn't matter what you're thinking about to get to some emotion or some scene, some yeah. event. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for me, what I've you know, found over the years is I don't use my own life. Okay. I'm sh- it, it's already mm. in there. It's in the soil. It's, it's already sure. in the you. fertile ground. I'm, yeah. I'm me. And, hmm. you know, if I am in the, the truthfulness and the honesty of the character and the life that this mm-hmm. person is living, then all of these things can make sense. I can make right. sense of them. I can mm-hmm. find what, what needs to get you there. Um, and so it's, for me, it starts with a character Bible that I flesh out. Okay. in order to know who this person is, where they came from, what their family mm-hmm. did, what their, you know, all of those things, their education, their childhood friends, their memories, their, the loves of their lives. Did they have any, their sexual experiences, all of those things, the culture, the music of the time, the clothes, what are they wearing? All of those things mm-hmm. that it goes so much into that, that the actual words on the page, gotcha. they're already, you know, they're already there that Mm -hmm. becomes a separate part of it as opposed to like, okay, well, when did I feel like this woman felt that is a separate, you know, Mm -hmm. that works and it serves some people and it doesn't work, serve others. And, you know, I think, um, in terms of, it doesn't matter how you get there. I think about Mm -hmm. this (laughs) time I was working on set with Alfrey Woodard. And yes. we had to do a scene on season one of Luke Cage. And mm-hmm. she, I had just found out that she had, you know, someone killed and I wanted to come in and, you know, rip her head off, but it was a two part scene. It was like, mm-hmm. you know, there's the moment where you come in and you talk to her and then you go back out and you, you find out, okay, no, actually she killed somebody and you have to go back in. Mm-hmm. And our director, Clark Peters, uh, not, excuse me, Clark Johnson, uh, actor as well. Mm. He's like, Alfred, how do you want to shoot this scene? And she's like, I want to shoot it all in one. 
Now these are professionals. These people, I mean, freaking Emmy award winning Alfred Woodard Clark, like they've been working longer than I've been on this planet. And I was like, you mother like, (laughs) because that meant for me that I had to come in, say what I had to say, go out, come right back in. Uh, I see. Okay. And the way that it was slated on the schedule, it was like, no, you're seeing but yeah. the way that it was slated on the schedule, it should have been, you shoot the first part and then you come and back and shoot the second part. No, she was mm. like, I want to shoot it all in one. And I remember walking out of the room and being so furious because I was like, how dare she? Am I going to get there? How am I going to get there? I'm literally going from zero to 100. Wow. And then I just said, oh, no, 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 you've got this. You know, this woman, you know what this is. You know, you've how done that work. Right. You've done that work. Mm. And I went out and I came back in and I legit almost threw Alfrey off of the chair. And part of it was a little bit of like, you messed up the scene. But then the other hey, part of it, it was like, thank use you. It. Yeah. Thank you. It was such a gift. Mm. And that's what makes awesome. her her. Like she mm-hmm. knows. And it was such a gift because there was no question of, am I going to get there? I got there because totally. y- you've done the work. Um, Thank you so much, Simone. This is also great. Can I ask you last goofy backstage questions? Yes. Um, what would you say is one performance you think every actor should see and why? Let's just go with August Wilson, mm-hmm. the piano lesson. Uh, it's, it's the, to me, the perfect marriage of, of spirit, of culture, of tradition, of, uh, the American dream trying to be realized in disenfranchised people and just mm. beautifully written characters uh, in a way that I think is, is brilliant. So I would say the piano. Wonderful. Lesson. Wonderful. And then last um, quick question, which I know is not a small question, but we've been trying to ask people, we've been trying to ask speaking, especially about this idea of actors not feeling empowered mm-hmm. um, given the state of the industry today and I mean, All Rise really speaks to this really well. What is your advice to actors of color, actors from minority groups, um, but really any artists of color for advice for how to navigate Hollywood today, the industry today? What do you wish, what do you want them to know? Be your authentic self. Mm. I spent so much time trying to fit into a commercial idea of what I thought people wanted to buy, what they were looking for from everything from my hair and the way that I wore it to the Mm. way that I dressed to trying to be a certain size Mm. um, to the way that I presented myself in a room. And it was so inauthentic to who I had spent my entire life becoming. Mm. And it wasn't until I said, they are going to get me. They're going to get my hat, my hair as nappy Mm. or as kinky or as coily or as curly as it's going to be. They're going to get my skin tone, my size, everything, my voice. Mm -hmm. Um, And what I think that we see in our industry today is that the industry is looking for that authenticity. You see it with shows like Insecure. You see it with performances by Kerry Washington and Viola Davis and, (laughs) you know, all of these phenomenal women who go and they, Anjanou Ellis and, you know, they, Mm -hmm. they, they give you themselves the beauty of Lovecraft country was how yes. authentic and specific it was to that culture. And those people, the more specific and honest that you are about yourself, the more confident you are when you walk into a room, mm. the more you have to gift to a particular project or production. And I think that until they want to make it, make it yourself. Ooh. They don't know what they want until you give it to them. Mm-hmm. We didn't know that we wanted to see two black girls be young and silly on HBO until we saw it. We didn't know that we wanted mm-hmm. sci-fi drama set in, you know, 1940s Chicago until yeah. we got Lovecraft. So be your own creators. Don't wait for someone to open the door for you. Open mm-hmm. it for yourself. It makes you happy. It feeds you artistically until you get the yes that you need to pay all your bills and to do it on a larger scale, but it only sharpens you so that when you do step on set, someone is paying you to bring your voice. You are not shy. You are not afraid to share it. You are not, you don't feel empowered. You don't feel like the token. You feel like the person that is meant to be there Mm. to bless that project. Mm. 
wow, you just tied it all together. The empowerment, the confidence, the what makes you happy, the Viola Davis. Thank you for bringing all this <laughs> back to Viola Davis. Oh, we really speak in my to language. Viola. <laughs> thank you um, so much. Simone, thank you so much. This is so lovely. This is great. And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi, guys. Christine McKenna Torella here, the backstage casting insider. Thought provoking conversation with Simone and Jack this week. As Simone said so well in the interview, you have to believe in yourself and have an attitude that you are empowered and you have self belief in the audition room. Quote, I think that so many actors would be so much happier with the process of doing the work of the process of auditioning, which is another part of the work, if we recognized the power that we have to advocate for ourselves. People always ask me why I didn't continue with acting. How did I know that acting wasn't the right career for me and then I pursued casting instead? And I've had different answers over the years, but the most truthful one is I didn't have the right mindset. I didn't have confidence in myself. When I was preparing this week, I read a very helpful expert article from Wendy Braun on Backstage on mindsets to avoid when you go into an audition. Wondering what they're looking for, looking around the room and in the waiting room and casting the show there and, and, and judging yourself and feeling as though you have to prove something. There were more and I did them all as an actor. I'll link the article in my notes so you can read it in full. And, and she has some great ideas about how to address those mindsets and flip it into something positive. There are two aspects, in my opinion, of mindset that you should tackle to have a successful audition process. The first is consistency and confidence in your audition preparation. When you get the audition appointment, take a step back, look at all the materials and details and dates of the project and ask the casting team all the questions you have. That way, you will be confident that you can prepare correctly. Read all the material you can on the project, especially the script if you can get it, and apply as much audition preparation technique as you can, i.e. complete the homework on the sides you have received. When you're fully prepared, you know that you have done your best, you've controlled all of the things that are actually in your control, and you can walk into the audition room with less unknowables. On the audition day itself, give yourself time to get ready and get settled and in the right mindset to succeed in your audition. The second aspect of a successful mindset is a little more complicated. Self-belief and a positive mindset is like a muscle. It's not Amazon Prime, it's not going to arrive overnight. It takes time to build and become strong, reliable and second nature. Having confidence in yourself and self-belief will take exploration. Here are a few things to explore adding to your daily routine. Try adopting a positive mantra that you can use throughout your day. Similarly, try positive affirmations. Try meditation as a way of calming what people call the monkey mind. And visualization. Visualize your success in your day, in your audition, in your career. Visualization in particular might sound a bit corny, but if you listen to interviews of world-class athletes and actors, you'll find that they use visualization as an important technique to see what they want and to go after it. If you're interested in affirmations or mantras, try looking at the Think Up app or the Shine app. Or for meditation, look at Calm or Headspace. There are a lot of thought leaders in the space of successful mindset, and here are a few I recommend. Hal Elrod, Robin Sharma, Gabby Bernstein, and Alex L. An excellent short book on this subject is called The Four Agreements. Talent is subjective, but being consistent and having the right mindset will lead you to success. As Simone said, when you're going into an audition, take control of the audition. Before I go into the casting highlights of this week, I leave you with one of my favorite affirmations. I belong in every room that I walk into. 
First off, if you're non-union, based in New York, there's a social media campaign for a health bar looking for a variety of actors. They're asking for a pre-screen of a simple self-tape where you ad-lib about yourself and the product. Sounds like a fun improv exercise. Details on the site. For my equity listeners, Creed Repertory Theatre is seeking video submissions for a project called To The Moon. It's a standalone, remote, digital event developed under their new play program. Something interesting about this theatre company is that one third of the productions of CRT that's been produced over the last 20 years have been world premieres. And they think that new plays are important because they share with us the diverse yet universal human experience details on the site. Finally, I find this project really interesting. Court Theatre Chicago is looking for equity actors for a project called Theatre for One, and the concept is eight short plays, each of which is performed by one actor for one audience member at a time. Sounds like a really interesting innovation um, for the times that we live in. They're seeking video submissions for the project, details on the site. That's all from me. Happy holidays, break a leg in your upcoming auditions, and have a beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City, and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.